all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, I'm Sharon Ullman. I was the producer of the Runaway video in 1995, and you're listening to Coruscast. Hi, and welcome to episode 12 of Coruscast. In this episode, we deep dive into the details behind the band's first music video, Runaway. And I'm very grateful to have been able to speak with a number of individuals who were present on set for this shoot, namely the producer, the cinematographer, and last but no means least, the director herself. I began my research for this episode by reaching out to the music video's producer, Sharon Ullman. Being curious, as always, about the guests' background and what led them to be working with the cause, I began our interview discussing just that. Enjoy. Thank you so much for spending your time, taking the time to out of your day to come on and, and speak about something that's now uh, 27 years ago. My pleasure. I usually start most episodes and most quote unquote interviews asking about your background and how you came to be working with the cause on their first professional video shoot for the song Runaway in Ireland and being a producer for it. How, how, what led you in your career to that moment? Um, yeah, what, what's your background? How did you get there? Um, I believe that um, I had started producing music videos probably a couple years before that. Um, I started out in commercials as a production assistant, and then I quickly moved to producer. Um, a, a director I met was like, you're going to be my producer and I'm going to teach you how to do it, even though you don't know how to do it. And so I was like, OK, I'll do that. So I went along with him. Um, we traveled pretty around the world, around the country and did a bunch of music videos. And then I met Randy St. Nicholas, who was the director of this Coors video. Prior to the Coors video, um, I production managed the Whitney Houston I'm Every Woman video with her. Incredible. That may have been my first video with her. And then I started working with her um, after that. And she asked me to go to Ireland with her to produce this video, which I think I remember came up very last minute. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been like, we're going to produce a video in Ireland in a week. I mean, it always was like that with music videos anyway, but, and I could be exaggerating some, but it was definitely, you know, hurry up. We have to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I jumped at the opportunity, you know, cause I love to travel. I'd love to produce at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, I jumped on it. The next thing I knew, I was in Ireland at my hotel, um, getting ready to do the shoot, which had numerous locations, numerous people. Uh, we had to bring in a stylist from Los Angeles as well. Uh, I don't remember what other crew flew in. I know the director of photography, I think it was Robert Brinkman. He was flown in, probably his assistant. And then we also... I believe we partnered with a local production company because I remember being at someone's office, uh, you know, prepping the video, but I don't remember who that person was. I do remember my Apple printer that I brought blew up at their office because I thought I could just plug it in. And back then the, there were no converters. So I, that, that's one of my memories of the course video is my sweet little Apple printer blowing up. Oh, just frying. Exactly. You've already, in that brief summary, given more details than we've ever known about this video. Oh, wow. Which oh, is, cool. Which is, um, yeah, enlightening and, and amazing. You Obviously, you mentioned several locations and the other people were, were flown in. Do you know who the stylist was? Yeah, I'm, I do. She was a good friend of ours. Rand, she worked with Randy for years and she was a good friend of mine and she's since passed away. Her name was Lynn Bagai. Oh, okay. Yeah, and she... She was a big rock and roll stylist in Los Angeles, did a lot of music videos, very, very close to John Bon Jovi and his wife, like very close. Mm. Um, and so she sort of had a thing about her where she made 
everybody feel really comfortable um, and sort of familial in that way. Mm -hmm. She, we always used to laugh about her. Um, we used to call her Limba because her name's Limba Guy. <laughs> she was a character, you know, like she had her way, she had her people, the way that her clothes came to her and all that stuff. And she always set up like a really nice um, dressing room for the artists. And I remember in particular on the chorus video, we were shooting on in an old train station with train cars. I think there's a train car scene in the video, if I remember correctly. Correct. And she took one of the train cars and made it into this like tent, you know, with like fabrics on the floor and all that. And, you know, she loved to lounge. Like we always used to tease Lynn that she should have a TV show from her bedroom, you know, from her bed. Yeah, She's yeah. like, you know, it was always about comfy and fabrics and stuff like that. So I remember she made this train car for her dressing room wow. um, for the cores in one of the trains. And, you know, I think it probably, you know, made them feel very comfortable. Also, just, you know, her her personality, her report yeah. was their first video, you know. The carriage where they're all together sort of singing, that's kind of draped out with, with fruit and other prop items. But, yeah, there's a lot of fabric involved in the shot. Yeah, that's very Randy and also very Lynn, but... She was more wardrobe, but Randy was definitely always, you know, when we did Celine Dion and other videos, mm. you know, they have a very similar aesthetic, you know, this, this rainy window, you know, mm. that was like a common theme of music videos of that time. Yeah, completely. Um, and I do also remember, this was something that Randy often did on her videos. She'd look at all the clothes, Lynn Ship boxes and boxes of clothing from Los Angeles mm. and Randy looks through oh, I don't know I don't know oh go back to my hotel room and get all of my clothes I think they would look good in my clothes so I think they're wearing a lot of Randy's clothing in the video in the end wow versus all the stuff Lynn brought and since then Randy has to designed and developed a clothing line like she has her own line which totally makes sense from my experience ah. of working with her all these years where she actually just wanted the artist to look like her you know so it's kind of funny yeah that creative vision uh, especially yeah. visually as a director what you want to see and if what you want to see is what you're wearing because that's your you know that's what you're into aesthetic um, yeah yeah that's the word yeah yeah so I do remember Lynn and I laughing about that. Like, she's like, oh, I shipped all these boxes from Los Angeles. And yet I had to go back to the hotel room and get a bunch of Randy's clothing. So, um, yeah, if I look back at the video, I'll probably, you know, be refreshed with that. But I, I know that happened. Wow. Um, so those were some of like the funny, fun stories. Like, you know, Lynn and I had a really nice time on that video just because we were laughing about that. And we sort of expected that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so... That's one thing I remember. Um, I also remember it was the first time I was on a shoot where they had these double-decker buses converted into a catering, like dining. And I thought like, that was so cool. I got introduced to that in Ireland. And I thought like, I'm going to buy one of those in New York and like make that a thing and like have that be my side business, which I never did, thank God. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, that's less, that's, you know, that's less pollution in the world, I guess, because of that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. According to um, the credits we do have, which is so minimal, that was uh, Pierce Street Station. Was the oh, station okay. It was, um, uh -huh. um, but do you, do you remember the, was it that the, the carriages on a certain track were stopped and then you used those carriages? I believe so. No, no, I believe we like, you know, they probably had one for filming. You know, like that happens here too. It's like we have a transit museum here and you can film, you know, to act like you're on the subway kind of thing. I, I feel like it was something like that. It was not active. I, I remember it being stationary, I'm pretty sure. And then there's a lot of the sort of forestry scenes or the tree or the park type scenes that, that was shot in Phoenix Park. So it's the largest right. park in, in Dublin. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful area. Um, I've been there many times. I've actually been there many times during the years trying to find the tree, the main tree Ooh. in the video. No success whatsoever. No, I don't remember that. I do remember, I remember the park, but I think also there were a few shots done sort of far away because I seem to remember that 
one crew stayed, maybe we were setting up the train station, for instance, and they went and shot some stuff and came back. And I did not go, but they went somewhere at some distance. So there was a second unit. Because there's, yeah. definitely, there's definitely parts of it that are shot in Glendalock, which is a monastery where there's mm. gravestones and gravel on the floor and huge monastery buildings. Were you involved in any of that? Well, I was involved in all of it, um, you know, with our local location scouts and production mm. team. Um, but I don't remember like the logistics or how we found it. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, how it used to work was there'd be um, like a proposal for the video and then that Randy would write in order to get the video. Right. And then we try to match up. Okay. We need to see a bunch of castles. We need to see a bunch of parks. We need to see a bunch of trains, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we would pick them from there. Um, but I don't remember yeah, I was there for the whole shoot. I just don't remember how we got all the places. And cool. Stuff. But there's something in my mind. Re I remember driving somewhere. So I don't think I went, but I may have gone somewhere else because I like can visualize this stop we did, but I don't know when that was. The reason I ask that is because this is a sort of a, a heritage center for the country. I, I've been there predominantly because of this video. And it's cool to be able to go through a main arch and see this exact location that we all remember from the video. And I've spoken to the, the visitor center mm -hmm. and I was, I, I went in there and said, Hey, you know, um, cause filmed a music video here. And they, they were not at all happy at all. They were like, Oh yeah, I remember the band coming in. They'd had no permit. There was no permission. And they, they recorded this video uh, without asking us, and we chased them off the property. Very likely. And maybe also why I didn't go, because maybe it was like, we're just going to go with a small crew and we're going to try to grab this shot. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's sort of how music videos used to be too. So that could explain why I didn't go. It was just who was needed, you know? And it's really weird because it's such a, well, it's understandable, but it's such a an iconic location of mm -hmm. heritage. And it's not in any of the credits for the for the video. <laughs> I see. Interesting. That that could explain it. I feel like they went really early in the morning mm. and got back because I, I feel like I would have gone if I didn't have another, you know, A, if there was room, but also if I wasn't doing something else. So I would imagine they went very early in the morning and then came back to, say, the train station, which was lit and ready to go, ready to go. you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. yeah. When you have a two day video, those things happen. Tell me about your first experience of meeting the band themselves. I don't remember, obviously, exactly the first meeting, but I do remember they were just really sweet, you know, really kind, like, you know, because I've done a ton of videos mm. at that point, you know, with Whitney Houston and Shaka Khan was there, and everyone was always really nice, but there was this certain... Um, you know, it was Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston, yeah. Houston was already Whitney Houston, so you treated her a certain way. You didn't get too close and all that stuff. Whereas that wasn't what how it felt with the cores. It was very comfortable. Randy um, is very nurturing and to all of her artists. And um, you know, depending on the dynamic between them, you know, she she sort of takes them under her wing, and this is going to be fine. I got you, that kind of thing. And so she definitely did that. I think they felt really comfortable with her in, right away. Yeah. Um, and I think all of us, I mean, it was like all of us working together kind of vibe, you know, knowing that they were new. Um, so I just remember it was a pleasant, pleasant meeting. They were very appreciative. They were new at this. So mm. they were eager and excited. You know, they had a great rapport between them. That, I remember that. I remember Randy, you know, being pleased with, you know, they're, they're lovely people. They were easy to light, easy to shoot, naturals, that kind of thing. So, you know, sometimes you get into a shoot where, depending on the artist, their age, et cetera, their comfort level, you know, you have to do some tricks. Yeah, yeah. And I re tend to remember, you know, that it was like very seamless. And, you know, there were not, none of those extra things that had to be fixed. You know, it was like, look at these beautiful people, they're naturals, they're comfortable, mm. let's do it, you know? Wonderful. Especially for a band that's so new and this is their first yeah. video shoot. It's like, yeah. 
yeah, ducks to water, as they say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And was it a case that everything was done sort of mimed to playback or was there live music played by them? Can you recall any of that? No, I think it was, it probably was all playback because most videos are all playback. So I would have to say probably all playback. Mm. Oh, the only, the, literally the only other detail we have in any credits is a throwaway line saying that it was a two day shoot. Does that ring any bells? Probably was. Yeah, I mean, usually you couldn't afford more than that, you know. I know that it was like a really long, you know, two really long days, which most mu music videos are, you know, they're almost 24 hours. Um, mm. I remember getting there, checking into my hotel the next day, right up, you know, we were shooting right away, getting home really late having a Guinness, which I was so excited to have in the hotel. I think we were at the Shelburne or something, whatever that hotel is with the like great Guinness, um, having that and going to bed, you know, because we had to get up early the next day. That's pretty much all I remember. I remember having some downtime, but it may have been that I stayed like an extra day at the end to wrap up or something, but, um, we really just worked the whole time. Yeah. Um, maybe we had a group dinner at the end. I know we went to dinner, but I don't know if they went or not. I don't remember at this yeah. point now. They may not have. Um, but two-day shoot was pretty standard those days, so probably so. Yeah. I'm sure we shot till the sun went down and probably later. There's a lot of overlaying in the video of different composite images. Were, were there green screen elements used to your, to your memory? I don't, I don't believe so, but that was sort of Randy's style back then. She does that like sort of overlaying stuff in her editing. So uh, I'm not surprised, but I don't think we did green screen now. I remember like many years later, I worked on a TV commercial with Britney Spears the day her song went number one. So she was essentially brand new, you know, it was the day she became famous on like this day. Mm. And it was, it was interesting, you know, to work with her as that, new artist you know her assistant was her mom's friend wow. um you know her her food requirements were like cereal you know like it was like a whole different person and so um you sort of think back to you know like for the chords we were doing their first video they were so lovely and gracious um and then i don't you know i don't really know what they became after that because i didn't so much follow their work but um you know it'd be interesting i mean they were they were so pleasant and easy from the get-go. You know, hopefully their personality stayed with them. Um, from everything I've seen, read, and those that I've spoken with, I've spoken to them, and the, the times I've met them and, and spoken with them at length, um, yeah, they, they've been very easy, they're very down to earth, um, and um, just just a joy to chat with, and and just incredibly genuine, really. Yeah. Cool. At the time, Randy worked with the same like colorist and editors. You know, so I would imagine they would have different version of input you know the after yeah we have, we've got no listing of who edited even she always worked with the same colorist i remember that sometimes i have these old numbers in my contact even though i don't <laughs> ever do that work anymore cool yeah dave hussey was his name was dave hussey was the colorist mm. that randy liked a lot he may have done this video. I mean, I think if she had a choice, that's yeah. who she used to use. He was in LA. I'm sure he still, I'm sure he still, probably still does that. You know, he was so nice and so good. Editors, I don't remember who could have, I don't remember offhand who her editors were. But like, if you ever got in touch with Dave Hussey, he probably would know who the editors were. Yeah, especially if he's color, if he's colorizing everything. Because there's yeah. certain shots in this that are black and white and they've just just taken everything out other than the green of the the tree or yeah. Um, yeah. shots of the fields and stuff where where it's been colorized manually in that way so yeah he was her favorite colorist i know that back in the day i don't remember the hair and makeup but i assume it was local somebody that they had because i don't remember traveling anyone for that i just remember traveling the stylist and i feel like we traveled the stylist very last minute I think she had to put all this stuff together in a day and get on a plane. It may have even been once we got there, we were like, shoot, we need Lynn to bring stuff. I'm pretty sure that happened. Thank you so much for taking the time. It, it was 
it was really good to relive um, the memories that you still have from that occasion um, and collected with others. Um, we really build a, a greater picture of the shoots over those days um, and what it was like to to be with the band in, in their first video for their first single. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a joy. Thank you. I appreciate you taking me back to 1995. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank See you again. Hi, I'm Robert Brinkman. I was the cinematographer on the Coors Runaway video, and you are listening to Coors Cast. Sharon's insights are all pieces of a puzzle that, until now, we simply knew nothing about. As you've just heard, Sharon mentioned that Robert Brinkman was the cinematographer flown over to shoot the video. After a number of emails and organising a mutual time, he very kindly agreed to discuss his work in Ireland on the video 28 years prior. Thank you so much for agreeing to take some of your time today. It's wonderful that you've agreed to talk about something that's now 28 years old in your career and in the fan history of this video. It's a beloved video by all those that have seen it and incredibly iconic. Um, so I'm very glad to have your time today, Robert. I'm happy to be here. I guess before we go talking about the video in, in itself, um, it would be great to know how you got to the point where your director of photography on this now iconic video, the first video by The Cause, the first release of their first single, of their first album, um, what led you to be in the position to be asked to do this? How did that journey work for you? Well, I had been doing music videos since the 80s, basically when I got out of film school. Um, and uh, at that point, I had also done feature films and other things, but it was still a staple of my work to, to shoot music videos. And one of my regular clients at the time was Randy St. Nicholas, who was a you know well-established photographer and music video director. And uh, she called me up and said, would you like to go to Ireland to shoot a music video? And I love Ireland. I've been in Ireland. I've done a lot of work with you too. So uh, I jumped on the chance. Um, I hear from the conversation I had with Sharon that it was quite a, a last minute project or a sudden project. Do you recall that it was kind of like a quick suddenly, oh, I need I need to jump. I need to come on this or. Yes, I do. But honestly, that wasn't unusual for the music video business. I mean, I you know remember that even working with a band like you, too, uh, you know, I was on vacation in Big Sur in California and got a call saying, can you be on a plane to New York this evening because uh, we have to redo the one video. And wow. uh, and so, you know, it happens a lot on music videos that uh, it's very, very short notice and jumping on a plane to go to some place to shoot it is, is not at all unusual. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Hectic, but rewarding and fun and spontaneous all at the same time, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and, you know, unlike feature films which or television series, which 
require a lot of preparation and planning and you're dealing with you know lots of actors and crews and stuff that has to be planned for months in advance so that every day of a 30 or 50 or 100 day shoot is completely scheduled before you ever start a music video is a one two maybe three day shoot and uh you know you don't necessarily have to deliver a complete script you know you want a performance you want images but you can you can do it on the fly if you need to wow yeah it's very different very different media completely yes yeah i'd probably like to preface talking about the video itself um for those that are listening who don't know what a director of photography does on a video shoot can you briefly explain what your responsibilities would have been for this video specifically well, director of photography is just a highfalutin name for cinematographer or cameraman. Yeah. Um, and that basically means operating the camera uh, and lighting. Um, mm -hmm. It's essentially the photographer for moving piece of film. Um, and in this case, the director, Randy, is a photographer herself. So, you know, she understands camera and lighting very well. Um, but she's normally a still photographer. And uh, because she also has to deal with the talent, she likes to have a cinematographer take care of those duties on her sets, but she's very involved in, in the look and the lighting and everything. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of locations in the video. Uh, prominent ones haven't been listed in the, the credits at all. Um, we've got Pierce Street Station in Dublin. Yes, um, yeah. Which is incredible. Um, I'd read an interview previously by Jim Cor that said the, the train in question had been recently used on the Michael Collins film that was released around the same time. Do you have any recollection of how the train got to be there for when you were setting up and filming or whether it was already in the station or? That train was in the station. And when we scouted that location, we scouted the train. It was a, it's a beautiful station. I don't know if it's still around. Um, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because a lot, of, a lot of those have changed. I remember shooting at the train depot, you know, in in Dublin, which I don't think exists anymore. But this was beautiful, and I remember taking still photographs myself because that train was so spectacular. Tell me, you still have those photos somewhere? Tell me, I do actually, and I have a few. I was actually just, but I'm I'm so ill prepared. And my apologies. I was just right before our interview, looking through my uh, closet. For those stills, I can probably find them and, and uh, send you a few. That would be incredible. I've done some research on the locomotive itself. Um, it's actually in dry storage at the moment, and this, they're they're trying to raise funds to rebuild it again um, because it was I think it was left with some water in the engine. And I, I'm certainly no locomotive expert, but apparently that's not so good for their engines for on a <laughs> train and it rusts and I don't know. Um, but the locomotive still exists, uh, but it's it needs service for it to be back on the rails and stuff again. Yeah. The scouting itself, when did that take place? It must have taken place right when we got there to Ireland. I mean, I don't remember in detail, but from looking at the video now, looks to me like it was probably a two or maybe a two and a half day shoot. Um, and I know we spent uh, time in that train station. We must have scouted it before because you can't just walk in there and shoot. No. Um, so we saw it maybe a couple of days before. So it was not a long prep. And uh, it was already there because we wouldn't have been able to afford to put a train in there. No, um, that's that's the magic of it, really. That's the magic. Yes. Is, is that maybe why the front locomotive isn't shot in this and you were just using the carriages to make it feel more generic? Or uh, I'm not sure that that was a conscious decision. We were basically just... Uh, trying to show off the train as much as we could. If there had been a locomotive, we might have shot it more. Maybe it wasn't there. Uh, we ended up focusing on one of the, um, you know, wagons of the train. And I know we used some smoke to make it look like the train was actually operating, which, of course, it wasn't. Nice. That's a good little tidbit. I like that. That's really nice. Yeah, I wouldn't have assumed that that was fakery and magic, but that's, that's what uh, I guess that's what behind the lens needs to be. One of the other iconic locations that's featured in this video is Glendalock Monastery, where you see Andrea with a broken down monastery and walking along gravel and stuff. Yes. Do you remember shooting those scenes? 
Yes, yeah, we were out there in the countryside and we didn't just shoot in the monastery, but also those other scenes um, on the field were in that same area, maybe just a few minutes from there. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't realize that. I assumed they were in Phoenix Park where some of the tree scenes, I believe, were shot. Yeah, that was separate. That field was uh, just way out there in the middle of nowhere and we're probably about five minutes or so from the monastery and very beautiful. Was there multiple crews for this that filmed on the single days? No, it was it was one crew and, and not a very large crew at that. I mean, you know, it was a, a relatively new band and a relatively limited budget video. I can't imagine it was, you know, a lot of money. And so, you know, we, we kept it very small in order to get the most uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. Yeah, that makes sense. Sharon mentioned other people that were on the, the crew, um, but she wasn't sure if they used local talent for hair and makeup. Do you have any recollection of that? I'm pretty sure that we did. Um, because, again, you know, not many people could have been flown over uh, from the States for sure. You know, there might have been people coming from London, mm. but um, I think at the time it would have been unlikely uh, with the band. I mean, for one thing, you're talking about a band that is incredibly good looking. Um, yeah, sure. You know, it doesn't really require a lot of help. No. And uh, and then again, with the budget limitations, it probably would have been unusual to fly somebody in for that. Do you know when it was filmed? Um, no, you, you would know that, right? I don't have the exact film dates, no. We, we just have the month, so it's like... Yeah, trying to pin it down is is tricky. Sharon's gone through floppy disks and floppy disks and haven't been able to find anything. I can I can check if I have information based on that. Um, in fact, if you don't mind, I'll just do a quick search here. Let me just check because I have a list here of um, crew uh, crew lists that I keep, and I scanned, I believe, most of the old ones. Oh my god. I haven't looked at this in so long. Oh, here, the cores. Look at this. Haha, <laughs> I got all the information you want. The cores, <laughs> runaway, shoot dates were Wednesday, August the 2nd, 1995, and Thursday, August the 3rd, 1995. Wow. Wednesday, as you know, was uh, Pierce Station. Mm -hmm. And then Thursday, it says Phoenix Park. But I know we drove out to the monastery also. Yeah, at the very least, we we figured out the um, the time, the shoot dates. Now, now I can say yes. I remember the uh, video was shot on August second and third, nineteen ninety five. Yeah, and you can just use that, and then I can just edit that in, and nobody will realize it. And my memory is unbelievable. Ma magic, just magic. <laughs> I'd love to know, uh, to your recollection, what it was like when you first met the band. I, I think my first time meeting the band in this case was on the set. Um, I'd seen pictures of them, of course, because Randy and I discussed how we would shoot and uh, what you know it would look like in the locations. But the first time I actually met them was when we were shooting. And those days, especially with such little preparation, are pretty hectic and, and you have a lot of stuff on your wish list that you want to shoot that day. So you pretty much have to hit the ground running. Mm. Um, so I met them uh, probably in the train station, you know, right when we were about to shoot. And uh, first time, you know, we get a look at the artist is when they step in front of the camera and we check the lighting. And uh, that that's probably how I met them first. You know, I mean, obviously, there are different kind of music videos that are narrative and that tell very uh, involved stories. Mm. Um, and this isn't one of those videos. You know, Randy is a photographer who is known for her beautiful imagery, and um, she makes a lot of artists look good. Um, in this case, that was a waste of talent because these <laughs> were very beautiful young uh, artists and didn't need any help, but it's still... Randy's approach to, you know, use beauty lighting and, and romanticize um, the look. And so we, we saw, shot a lot of different setups um, that thematically responded to the song. But, um, you know, it was more of an emotional thing than uh, a worked out storyline. 
So we shot in each of these setups and then she put it together in the editing and decided what looked good and what worked. What was this video shot on film wise? 16 millimeter film. So um, I'm pretty sure we shot color film, not black and white, um, even for the black and white images. Um, just because at the time that was more efficient and easier. And there, there are reasons to shoot black and white, but I don't think we did that in this case. Do you remember anything about the brief at all? No, I mean, we, we had, you know, different performances in different places. So we pretty much, in this case, just shot the entire song in various different locations. Mm -hmm. And then Randy edited uh, that together into one video. But it wasn't outside of, you know, shooting these impressionistic images and performances in these locations. There wasn't a script, you know, it wasn't planned out in, in uh, detail. We would basically just shoot and the best footage out of these different uh, setups was picked to put together the video. Wonderful. Can you tell me more about the shoot itself with, with photos? Because no stills photography has ever been seen of this video. Randy did this on a lot of her shoots and I'm almost certain that she did it on this as well. In fact, I'm certain because you know why I'm certain? Because I was playing with my graph legs, you know, which meant I was free because she was taking stills. And some of the stills I took are similar to hers because, you know, she would set them up, the band, and then I would just use my graph legs and get some images. And she was shooting similar images herself. I had at the time this graph legs still camera, which is a very old fashioned box camera, um, you know, that was like out of style in the 50s. And I was playing around with that. So I took these gigantic negatives. It, it'll, you know, it'll look a little different, but I just, I was just playing with that camera while we were there. But since she's a professional still photographer, which I'm not, um, and she always did this on, on her shoots, shooting stills as well, uh, she presumably has a more professional cataloging system and should be able to find those. Fingers crossed. Um, that'll be the next conversation. That'll be the next conversation. Wonderful. Oh, that's really, yeah, that, in, that makes perfect sense though. You're, you're not filming. So what are you doing? You're waiting for somebody else to do something while it's all set up. So yeah, otherwise I would have been busy and I know I couldn't have played unless she was doing something like that. Exactly. Oh, I, ca I can't wait to see. I honestly can't wait to see. This is going to be really insightful. Is there any other moments that you remember while filming the band? Anything happening? They were all incredibly nice and they were very excited about the video. And, uh, you know, Andre was a little bit of a celebrity already because she'd been in the commitment. So, you know, she was uh, an actress and uh, also at the same time sort of the, the front person of the band. It, it was an exciting time for them, you know, and uh, I think we all felt that. And, but they were also at the same time so approachable and so nice that, uh, you know, every, I mean, it, a lot of people, when you talk to them about jobs, say, oh, we had a great time making it. Um, and it's a bit of a cliche, but it's really true in this case, because especially for Randy and myself, you know, we came from Los Angeles to Ireland, which is like a vacation, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we got to see all these beautiful places in Dublin and outside of Dublin. And, you know, we we hung out with the band and, and, you know, I know we went out the night after we finished to celebrate and, you know, actually stayed in touch. I, uh, I don't know how many years later, it can't have been that many, maybe a couple of years later. So they were all at my house in North Hollywood for a dinner party, the whole band and their manager, um, because I like to cook and, you know, I uh, had them all over and, so it was just, they were down to earth, nice human beings. They weren't, you know, unapproachable. They were friendly. They were cooperative. It was just an easy shoot and uh, a good song. And that's really all you can ask for. What more could you want, eh? What more could you yeah. want? What a great place to end on, on that kind of sentiment. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to take some of your time and, and cast you back 28 years ago to your work on this 
iconic video. Um, it's been lovely to chat and get a brief understanding and feel of what it was like to be behind that lens for their first video. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers, bye. A huge thank you again to Sharon and Robert for taking their time to discuss their work. It's really wonderful to finally have some details about locations and how incredibly last minute the shoot was pulled together. Robert mentioned a number of images he took while on set. A link to these can be found in the show notes. As mentioned by Robert, the train was already in situ when the location was being scouted. With further details provided by him, I was able to contact the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland, who confirmed they owned the locomotive and carriages used, and were thrilled to be able to hand me some set photos from the day, which I happily scanned, and links to these are again as always in the show notes for this episode. The team on the ground organising the two-day shoot were the Irish production company Dreamcatcher Productions with the location manager being Charlotte Summers. I was able to contact her and she confirmed the exact part of Phoenix Park used for the scenes where the band are filmed against a single tree. And I know that I'm not the only fan that has gone to the park in recent years hoping to find that elusive tree. Again, look to the show notes to find these geolocation coordinates. Many fans have been curious as to how and why the shots of Andrea falling past a carriage window were used. While I can't speak as to why Andrea is falling, only Randy St Nicholas, the director herself, knows why this was visually decided to be included. I can, however, share details of how the shot was filmed, as revealed by the production booklet for the crew. This scene was shot to green screen, filming from within the carriage, and liberal use of a stunt mattress to cushion a short fall. I was actually able to speak with Randy St Nicholas, who directed Runaway, and while she has published books on her decades of work with both Prince and Whitney Houston, she expressed that she would prefer to let her work speak for herself when it came to the cause. She was, however, incredibly glad that the work of Lynn Bugai was being highlighted in this episode, and she shared this statement describing working with her. Limbu Guy, the uniquely talented girl who I worked with for many, many years, is a whole other story. She had brilliant taste, was hilariously funny, and creatively inspired at all times. She was always ready to jump into a project with 200% focus, work with whatever budget was given, and would pull it all together any place in the world that she was asked to travel to last minute, and all accompanied by a laugh-out-loud story about how she pulled it off, and an invite to her next party, which she threw almost every weekend. She will be forever in a league of her own. Randy was also able to kindly dig through her archives and found a series of stills taken by her while filming for this video. Again, select examples of these can be found in the show notes. Please, if you could, take time to review the podcast on the platform you're listening on. It's a huge help in the ability to reach other fans with the work, especially iTunes, if you're listening on any Apple device. Please make sure to subscribe if you're listening via the YouTube channel, and I'll be sure to check the comments section regularly for those of you who have questions or further information to share. Again... Thank you for listening. You've been listening to CauseCast.